everyone. Hope you've had a great afternoon. Welcome, I guess, to day two, afternoon two of HashiConf. It's great to be here. My name is Robbie Bilson. I'm a developer advocate at AWS, and I pretty much spend every waking moment thinking about our edge computing portfolio, thinking about how we can serve the needs of the developer community. And I'm joined here by none other than JC Straley from the Verizon team. You want to introduce yourself briefly? I'm JC Straley. I'm uh, based here in LA, work in the Playa Vista lab, and I work on technology and product development. So today we're going to talk about 5G and edge computing. Maybe raise your hand if you have a 5G phone. Anyone? Great, great, great. A lot of hands up here. And what we want to show you today is how you can use that 5G device and connect to new cloud computing endpoints that are topologically closer to you. We're going to learn more about some of the architectural challenges that are introduced by these new environments and how HashiCorp Console can natively solve these challenges in a repeatable, automated, and flexible way. So to start things off, I think we have to define our terms here because the edge can really mean a number of things, right, JC? It can mean yeah, a device, CDN. radios, CDN, yeah. the, cloud, the cloud itself. When yeah. you talk about edge, what does it mean to you? So today, what we're going to talk to you about is the carrier edge. You know, at the edge of the 5G and 4G network. So let me go right here. And what we're going to talk to you about specifically is Verizon 5G Edge with AWS Wavelength. And so a lot of you might be asking, I hope you're not, but what is a Wavelength Zone? So Wavelength Zone, you know, basically extends AWS infrastructure uh, to the region, to the 5G Edge. And within the region, uh, wavelength zones cover major metropolitan areas, in, in, including in the United States. It's 19 locations. You know, it's in Atlanta, Dallas, and it's all across the United States. And and uh, so you can. The thing you can do with this is you can build a, a VPC in a region and extend it out to the wavelength zones in that region. And the infrastructure is monitored and managed from that region. And so. The thing that we're uh, showing you here today, it has the same pace of innovation, and it's geographically distributed all across. Them. And the coolest thing for me to talk about is the fact that this AWS infrastructure that you're all used to using is extended into the, um, to our actual metropolitan, actual, uh, metropolitan aggregation points, if I could say that correctly. So it's actually in our 5G data centers. So when you actually connect to an app that's on a wavelength zone, you're actually connecting directly, not any internet hops, it's right there on, on the end. So here's some characteristics of the Wavelength Zone. First, you can access all your services in the same single pane of management. You have operational consistency. The same way uh, that things are upgraded, it's patches of, so one key thing is that when you go into the console, you don't really, once you opt into Wavelength, you don't have to go into any special section. Everything's there, you know, EC2, storage, compute, it's all right there. And the other cool thing is that when you build a VPC, it's a failover zone. So, you know, if, if you, something fails in the wavelength zone, it goes right back to region. Okay, so that's all the preliminary. So the thing I want to talk to you about next is the cool thing that I get to, got to build. Uh, I'm, in here, I'm here in LA, and uh, this is something I actually built on the wavelength zone. As you know, LA, there's been a great amount of innovation in media production workflows uh, driven by studios in their Movie Labs uh, joint venture. Consistent with their vision, we challenged ourselves to bring production workflows onto Wavelength, starting with one of the most challenging in terms of compute requirements, latency, security, and reliability, and that is video editing. So for video editors, they're notoriously, video editing is notoriously compute intensive and sensitive to latency. Usually an editor fiercely works on his or her keyboard to observe, maneuver, and edit the video and its timeline. At any given time, the virtual or real machine transcodes it and renders it onto a high screen resolution to make sure the audio and video tracks are in sync. And this render is then streamed to the client device where edit tasks are performed. Considering that the editor is usually make, using visual cues to make his edits, it's very important that he gets the video and audio to closely reflect the fast key strips made by him or her. So one thing I learned in my work, you know, I'm, I came in from a technology point, is the importance how much editors, they rely not just on visual cues, but on sound cues. And they need those to arrive quickly and reliably. So you can see up here, uh, like a rough, uh, this is how much latency we were working against. The constraint was like about tw 20 milliseconds. 
when you think about 24 frames per second, it's about 41 milliseconds until each frame shows up. So um, we can't, we, we realize that when we're working on cloud, it didn't quite meet that latency budget. The user experience became painfully slow and jittery with plenty of skip frames and an extreme mix match in audio and video sync. So with the deployment on Verizon 5G Edge with AWS Wavelength, editors worked in mobile locations and had a great video edit editing experience, no skip frames and no lost packets. And to be honest, we were actually kind of surprised when that first happened. And we had editors come in and use it and it would just work great. So the subjective experience of the editors pretty much matched the experience of, our, uh, of an on-premises uh, edit session. Right? So, so if I just continue down. So, to quad, yeah, so on the next slide here, let me show you right here. So this is what we built out. So we built this awesome environment on edge editing, but then we thought, okay, we built something very specific to editing and it worked because we know that space. And uh, it, was, it was rewarding to see the editors kind of love it. But then we thought, well, that's a very specific use case. And we wondered how can we take what we learned and build for more general use cases. So for our next step, we built what we called our workflow orchestrator. And that's what I'm showing you up here. You can see the familiar AWS. And then down here on the left, you see what we actually were building. We started with an editing environment based on our previous work. But this same tool could be used for, you know, um, it could be used for all kinds of other use cases, including retail, uh, automotive, uh, healthcare, first responder environments, just to name a few. So it starts off with essentially an engineer, and you guys are all familiar with this, <laughs> building a template, and we did this in Terraform uh, for our first blush, yeah, building a template, and then somebody like a technical director who's a manager, anytime they want to start up a project, they could just bring up that template uh, and then configure the project, uh, have the, uh, uh, put in the configuration for who's going to be allowed access to it, and then put in what's going to be exactly in that uh, environment. And then press a button, and within the time of APIs on AWS, which is very speedy, you know, in a short time, they had an environment. And so they could, instead of like uh, what we were talking about before, especially during COVID, instead of having to pack up a machine and ship it out to, uh, to an editor or and getting licensing and wait all that, what might take a week or two, they could press a button and have an editing environment set up with like 15 minutes, right? And like I said, we're looking at doing this in other kind of areas as well. But one thing, we did get it to work and we thought this is great. Well, game over. But then we realized, wow, this is for one wavelength zone. And as I talked to you about, we have like 19 wavelength zones and we're getting even more. So how can we scale this to work across multiple wavelength zones? And that's when we started talking to Robbie. That's exactly right. And I mean, this is such an incredible use case, the ability to bring video production to the edge in a way that reduces latency, but ultimately just makes the user experience better. And I'd love to produce movies, but I don't think I'm cut out for that. So JC, what are some of the other use cases and verticals that you're seeing adopting AWS Wavelength? We, we do it at, well, we have C2VX, we're doing it with automotive, you know, to make it more safe. Uh, we do it in retail, we, you know, care, you know, uh, uh, cashless um, checkout. Uh, we're seeing it across venues and live broadcasting. We've just seen so many, so many different use cases. I think and IoT, of course, is one of our favorite. That's exactly right. So just to, I guess, bring that point home, you can think about AWS Wavelength as delivering two flavors of applications. First of all, with your consumer smartphones, those on a Verizon connection in the United States can absolutely leverage AWS Wavelength for lower latency media and entertainment experiences, as an example. But it's also for B2B workloads. So you have a fleet of IoT devices or really any connected mobility use case. You can absolutely use AWS Wavelength as well. And the beauty now is it's not connecting to a single gateway. You're not designing applications for low latency in a single location. You can do so in a geo-distributed fashion. Build that same experience in a number of different locations, certainly across the United States and for Wavelength more broadly across the globe. But buckle up, folks. It's time to talk architecture. And I think I need my handy-dandy phone to really walk through how that works. Can we go back to the previous slide, JC? I want to walk through a little bit about how AWS Wavelength works. We want to go back to that previous slide just to showcase the VPC constructs. While we get that sorted out here, one, folks. Yeah, one more, one more slide back, sorry. There, there we go. All righty. Seeing a lot, of, a lot of stuff here, so let's break it down. 
Start with your device right here, a Verizon connected 4G or 5G device. So we talk a lot about 5G edge computing, but it also works with a 4G device, no problem. And when you think about a 5G architecture, I'm going to break down everything you need to know about mobile networks like 120 seconds. Got a device. That device connects to an E node B, which is essentially a radio in the 4G world, or a G node B, which is a 5G radio. And all of those radios in a given area converge or connect to a single carrier data center or aggregation point. That's the carrier data center that you see here on the slide. And what happens in that carrier data center? Well, all sorts of stuff. It's often referred to as the packet core, or radio access network. Point being, it's how mobility is ultimately architected. All of the functionality you need to build a mobile network, most of it sits in this packet core. But there's one specific area or network function that's really, really important to take away. It's called the packet gateway in a 4G world. That's where your mobile traffic anchors to an IP address so that you can connect to wherever you're going. Whatever, maybe your sports application, the news, uh, your next version of AR, Pokemon Go, whatever it may end up being. So in that packet, right next to that packet gateway is the AWS compute and storage. And that's what you're seeing here. Within the carrier data center, the wavelength zone is itself within that geography, within that carrier data center, but exposed to you as a developer as just another availability zone. I don't think I need this prop anymore. So now we know what a wavelength zone is. It really behaves much like an availability zone, but with a few important distinctions that I want to highlight here. The first thing you need to note is it's geographically distinct. But if it behaves like another availability zone, you're going to ask me, well, wait a minute, Robbie. How, how do all these AZs connect? You've got availability zones in the parent region. In this example here, I have three. Each of these availability zones don't share a single point of failure. Of course, the wavelength zone can be seen as a separate failure domain. How do they connect? That's where something called the service link is so important. The service link, unbeknownst to you, something you don't have to manage as the developer, seamlessly provides that redundant connectivity back to the region. We often call this the parent region. Every wavelength zone has a parent region in the United States. There are two regions that leverage AWS wavelength zones. You have US East 1 and US West 2. So US East 1 in Northern Virginia, US West 2 in Oregon. But make no mistake, the parent region has very little to do with the underlying geography of the wavelength zone. What if I told you that as part of US East 1, you could have wavelength zones in Boston and Miami? So now you've built out these hub and spoke architectures with wavelength zones potentially separated by a thousand miles. That's crazy, right? That's new. That's a different networking architecture. Two other things I want to call out here on the slide. Something called the CGW, the carrier gateway. Behaves similarly to an internet gateway, but the natting that's happening is between private IPs within the VPC so that they can intercommunicate and carrier IPs, which look and feel a lot like public IPs, but the underlying pool of addresses are being exposed, in this case, right through the Verizon carrier network. So this is a great example of our partners working together with us to expose otherwise really complicated parts of the 5G network, but so you as the developer don't have to think or care how they're ultimately and underlyingly built. That's AWS Wavelength for you folks. But now we got to get to console. How does console play in? We talked about edge awareness, geodistribution. Give me an example of when we'd use that. So JC was talking about this video production use cases where it was great that it'd work in LA, but what if I want to do it in San Francisco and Seattle and Denver and Vegas all at once? One way you could do that is via EKS or Kubernetes managed by AWS. And one way this could look like, you could launch your control plane and how EKS works today. You launch your control plane in the region and you specify a series of subnets. If you try to specify a subnet corresponding to a wavelength zone, that configuration is not supported. So very similar EKS configurations to what you would probably use today. Now, if you wanted to have a node group or set of worker nodes in a wavelength zone, Fargate isn't supported, managed nodes are not supported. You use self-managed nodes, which you can think about as an auto-scaling group with a specific AMI optimized for that version of EKS, where the kubelet says, hey, I'm going to go talk to the Kubernetes control plane with this API server endpoint and this uh, CA, and you're good to go. Now, with that being the architecture, you think you're done, right? Simple. You just deploy your services and deploys, and you're good to go. Well, let me give you the following scenario. High level, illustrative, but yet incredibly important. It's going to start with a three-tier web app, but let's, let's just simple it even further. Two-tier web app, you've got a web service and an app service. And that web service, right now, assume it's wavelength zone three, 
wants to talk to the app service. Typically, if you were to schedule a deployment, the underlying pods could be scheduled in one or many wavelength, uh, rather availability zones. And it's a full mesh networking topology. By that I mean USD East 1A can communicate with USD East 1B, which can communicate with USD East 1C. It's no problem, they're all right next to each other. But remember what we talked about with AWS Wavelength. It's hub and spoke. You've got to get back to the region via the service link. So if I wanted to go from Wavelength Zone 1 to Wavelength Zone 2, I can't from within the VPC. Meaning, you see these red and green lines on the slide. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that web service, if it was trying to talk to app, Kubernetes DNS may not know better where to send that traffic. It might get lucky and send you to the app service conveniently located in Wavelength Zone 3, but it could guess wrong. It could try to send you to Wavelength Zone 2 or Wavelength Zone 1. The impact of that, of course, your application hangs because Kubernetes DNS doesn't know any better. It could also try to send you back to the region, which it would work, but there's a latency penalty. So when I talk about topology-aware routing, wouldn't it be nice if DNS just knew that when I was saying, hey, go to app.default, just go to the app in Wavelength Zone 3, and if for some reason it's not available, then go back to the region. So that sort of tiered routing approach that's intentionally edge-aware, that was the North Star. But I don't want to build a two-tier web app. That's, uh, that's no fun. I wanted something that could really bring this to life. You gonna help me out here, JC? Exactly. HashiCup or HashiCups? We go to the next slide. We built HashiCups on uh, AWS Wavelength. I thought that'd be fun. You know, we're gonna 5Gify uh, the HashiCups application. So, how do we do it? There we go. We didn't use all of the microservices just to simplify the deployment here. We chose um, four of the key ones that we believed were illustrative of the primary routing decisions that you as an application developer in an edge computing environment may have to make. You have a front end service, then you have a public API service, a proxy, then a product API service, and then a Postgres database. And so the, the, the connection flows I've tried to illustrate here, you go from mobile device to front end, to public API, to product API, to Postgres. So if you want to take note of this, again, we'll recap, but that flow is going to be important in terms of how we configure the routing here. So what do we do? We wanted to create this, again, seamless, repeatable way to make all of these routing decisions easy. And so just to highlight the configuration, what you're seeing here in the simplest form, you'll see that availability zone two, I didn't deploy a carbon copy of the services. I could have, but for simplicity, just think of that second availability zone as another subnet hosting the EKS control plane and really nothing else. It happens to also be running a copy of core DNS uh, in the kube system namespace, again, for Kubernetes DNS reasons. But for now, let's just focus on three of those AZs. You have an availability zone in the parent region, so if I'm not on the Verizon mobile network, which could be as simple as I'm a Verizon device, but I've switched to Wi-Fi, you still wanna be able to access the service, right? So think of that as being the one-stop uh, solution for some of these edge cases, no pun intended. And then Wavelength Zone 1 and Wavelength Zone 2 give you that geo distribution. Could you extend it to five, six, seven Wavelength Zones? Absolutely. But for illustrative purposes, let's just assume I deployed two of the, uh, each of those three services to those two wavelength zones. Now you might ask me, well, Robbie, where's Postgres? Why, why is it only in the region? Well, I'm gonna throw another, another curveball at you. What if you don't wanna have every copy of every microservice in every single AZ? That's not realistic. So just to showcase the complexity that we believe is representative of an application, what if Postgres were to only exist in the region? So here's the question we tried to solve. Jump to the next slide, you're gonna see some question marks. The question mark means this is a potential path that your application traffic could try to take. My mobile device connects to the front end service, the front end service connects to the public API. And now the public API service wants to eventually get the catalog information for all of those hashi cups and uh, hashi coffees, I guess, that I could order. So it could try to guess and send you to wavelength zone two, which we discussed is blocked. You don't want that to happen. In fact, you want a deterministic way to make sure that that routing path is never invoked. Now, again, you could send traffic to the product API in the region, but you'd only want to do so under the scenario that something happened in the wavelength zone and it's no longer available as a failover or a next best alternative. So how do you care for all these question marks? Well. Step one, and a very important step one, or rather step zero, are just Kubernetes namespaces. And I wanna show you the limitations of what you could do in the absence of console. I think that's important to, to highlight. And the reality being, 
Most of the time, in seeing fairly basic scenarios, you would probably be okay. And you notice that the hesitancy that I use here. This is a very important foundational step to leveraging console, and here's why. When you think about DNS and Kubernetes, namespaces is a great way to provide logical isolation. So instead of we were asking before, hey, where's app.default? If front end's just saying, hey, where is public API? Kubernetes DNS will assume that you're referring to the namespace in question unless you specify otherwise. So you're saying, all right, Robbie, we're done. Front end can route to public API, public API can route to product API, we're done. But remember, Postgres is in a different namespace. We haven't solved the namespace problem now because DNS is gonna be blissfully unaware if you only provide just Postgres as essentially the URL to route to or the service to route to, it's not gonna know where it is. Now you might be saying, well, wait a minute, developers could just hard code this. But think about how unwieldy that's going to get as the number of edges continues to grow ever larger. You're not gonna to wanna to hard code it. You're gonna to wanna to decouple application developers building your app and the cluster operators who maintain the infrastructure. So this is how we get to step one. Console, console service mesh. I often define service mesh as essentially that um, infrastructure layer that helps facilitate service to service or secure service to service communication. And the way that console does that is you have that control plane consisting of console server, and I'm running that in the region. Again, that's really important, running console server in the region because with the hub and spoke architecture, if it were scheduled to one of the wavelength zones, now the control plane can't communicate to all of its worker nodes. And of course, that would become a problem because the catalog wouldn't be up to date. So server is explicitly scheduled to the region, and then you have console client running as a daemon set, so every copy of the node, or rather every node, can have access to console client so that proxies can be injected, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a good start. We've laid out the foundation for how we're gonna use console. And just out of the box, we're now gonna have services that can register to the console catalog. And using a feature called transparent proxy, if you were to do absolutely nothing, the application would behave just as described before with namespaces. Still, you, you have console running, traffic within the namespace will be routed to the namespace. The way that routing would happen, of course, would be through the proxy that uh, is essentially routed through the sidecar of each pod, which is a good start. But now we gotta get to Postgres. So how do we do it? Well, we've got a handy dandy solution. There are a lot of different features of console that we find really valuable. But one feature I wanna turn your attention to is this idea of service resolvers that are implemented as a CRD in Kubernetes. What that means is it's a, essentially a custom object where I say, well, wait a minute, Kubernetes, I know you're looking for Postgres, and I know you can't find it because it's not in that namespace, but it's okay, I'll tell you. Always look in the region namespace, or I think I named it demo app region in my application. And so that's how you get that arrow, that guaranteed deterministic routing pattern, because otherwise, anything could happen. So just to show you what that manifest looks like, probably thinking it's 100 lines of code. Nope, eight. Let's jump to the next slide here. Yep, that's it, folks. Specify the service, specify the namespace, and you can recycle this manifest for any number of wavelength zones or namespaces you choose to leverage. So when I say it's, auto, uh, it's easily automated and repeatable, this same manifest could be used across a number of namespaces because no matter what wavelength zone, which is itself a namespace as we've defined the pattern, you can always find Postgres because it'll always be scheduled to the region. So we say it's extensible, it's repeatable, that's why eight lines of code that can be used over and over again, completely independent of the application logic your developers are building. So that's a good step two of three. We still haven't cared for the scenario, if we jump to the next slide, of failover. You'll see, well, wait a minute, Robbie, where'd product API go in wavelength zone one? Well, imagine a scenario. These are highly ephemeral 5G environments. Anything could happen. Maybe it's a manual misconfig, or maybe just something happened. Assume for a moment product API is down. Don't panic. We still gotta get to our hashy cups, right? I still need my coffee. We don't want the app to go down. We have a solution. We just need to fail over to that namespace in the region. Again, we don't want to fail over to another wavelength zone. We want to fail over to the region. And the way that we do that is also a service resolvers, but instead of the redirect pattern, we want to use failover. And you'll see we have a, a wildcard there basically saying if our current um, application can't find product API the service, send all traffic to product API in the namespace that's designated demo app region. So once again, a deterministic way to create failover 
in these edge environments, which we think is really powerful. So again, just to recap, same service resolver, same object, same CRD, two different use cases, but when brought together, we believe you now have something called edge awareness because it's not even important just about the understanding of latency. It's an understanding of topology of the network. And we believe that console does this really well. If you were to implement this in your video workflow environment, you could have the production editors in Atlanta and Miami, and as these microservices scale and move to different environments, it's the same configuration manifest over and over and over again. The complexity doesn't increase as the workload continues to evolve. We think that that's really powerful. We want to do a little quick demo um, in our next section here. Think of this more as like the cluster admin view. I just wanted to show you that this doesn't really introduce any more complexity as you would typically use, say, kubectl as you develop your application. So I just want to walk you through the two scenarios that we just created. Got two little quick videos here walking you through how that, how that works. So imagine for a moment, I've already deployed my console Helm shot. You'll see the console client is running as a daemon set. You'll see it's scheduled to each node. And then you'll see here that console server is explicitly scheduled to the region. Um, now, the next thing I wanted to show you is just deploying the application to each of those wavelength zones and then just Postgres to the region. I just created a quick little automation. Again, this template will be available for you in the coming weeks. But I want to show you what happens and the workflow for doing so. So the first thing I wanted to do is inspect the pods for the region. So you'll see that Postgres is scheduled to the region. You're seeing step zero of my demo in action, that you can scope and namespaces, which will solve most of the problems. You look at wavelength zone one's namespace, you'll see that front end, product API, and public API are all there. And then you see that wavelength zone two also has a copy of each of those three services. And that's the key point, the service resolver right there. That's the missing piece. So as you have the configs for the pods in each of the wavelength zones, you have the config for the service resolver, and you're good to go. Now, you see Postgres again, that's in the region. It's a lot of the same. So what I'm trying to highlight is this is really no different than how you would have deployed to the region today. The only difference is making sure that in each namespace, only workloads corresponding to that wavelength zone are scheduled to that namespace. And you can do so with patching or annotations, a number of ways to do that. And then with the service resolver, you're good to go for most scenarios in the absence that a particular service doesn't fail. Let's jump to the next scenario, I think. And in this scenario, we're going to highlight what happens if product API fails. Public API still needs to find a copy of product API, so how does it do that? And you're just seeing, again, I wanted to showcase that this is the environment only changed before that I put a full copy of the app in the region. And this is the manifest file. We say, first and foremost, in Wavelength Zone 1, let's cause chaos. Let's remove product API. All we need to do in the public API manifest is say, hey, disable transparent proxy and then configure explicit upstreams where we say, hey, if you're looking for product API from public API, go to this port on localhost, which will seamlessly route you through the proxy to that service. And so you'll see here localhost 9090, you're good to go, and then we would deploy this new manifest. So very, very simple. Again, it's one manifest that you could recycle over and over because you would be failing over to that same service in the region. And so we believe that this is a really powerful pattern as you see here. And again, this is just updating the manifest and we're good to go. I want to transition now, JC, to just wrapping things up a little bit here and talk about sort of who cares. We talked about the industries that, and again, you're just walking through all of the available pods as you now see in Wavelength Zone 1. You'll see product API doesn't exist, but yet we're good to go. And so as this quickly completes, we talked a little bit about all the industries that this could leverage. This isn't a solution just for video production. IoT, retail, um, media entertainment, healthcare, the list Automotive. goes on. So as you think about the power of HashiCorp console to provide this edge-aware routing, what are you most excited about? What use cases and opportunities strike you? I'm excited about removing kind of the roadblocks for developers. You know, you know when you try to do with all these different wavelength zones, you know, admittedly, you know, it's hard to know where to place and how to load them and do all this work. I'm excited by what developers are going to be able to do using service mesh and console to deploy apps across our network. So to make it so it's just as easy as, as developing a, a cloud app now. 
I totally agree with that. And I think just to build on that, a few areas I'm excited about. First and foremost, I'm excited for the rest of HashiCon. For all of you here who want to learn a little bit more about how consoles uh, continuing to evolve, right after this session, Irina from the console team is going to talk a little bit about some of the latest announcements for console. I know I'm going. I hope to see you there and continue the, the great discussion. But I do want to highlight, as we jump to the next slide, we want to see you build with us. If you have any questions, please reach out. We want you to see us as your trusted partner for building highly distributed edge applications. We want to hear your feedback. We'd love for you to try this demo and just let us know what you think. But I do want to highlight that there's so much more work to do in this domain. This is the very beginning. We've yes. scratched the surface for what you can build at the edge with 5G. You'll notice that we've talked a lot today about within the cluster communication or east-west traffic. And we believe that console is really powerful in addressing that solution. But we intentionally omitted a whole other exciting problem space around the north-south traffic domain. So much so that a mobile device, what if I told you that a mobile device could be in Miami and the closest wavelength zone could be in Boston? I like to borrow from the airline industry when they say the closest exit might be behind you. Same idea for edge applications. It has to do entirely with the topology. What packet gateway are you anchored towards? Things like that, that only carrier-exposed APIs can solve. It turns out we did a really nifty integration with Terraform on how you can automate that entire workload. And if you want to learn more, you can check out a recent uh, HashiTalks presentation we did with the fabulous Rosemary Wang of HashiCorp if you want to learn more about that. But whether you're thinking about east-west traffic or north-south traffic, 5G and edge computing, a really exciting problem space. We'd love to see you build with us. We're super excited about the promise of HashiCorp, both Terraform, console, and beyond to make development at the edge easier. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of HashiComp. Thanks for joining us. We know you had a lot of uh, choices this afternoon. And uh, we hope to hear from you and your feedback. Thanks so much.